Hi, welcome. My name is Peter Russell. I'm the Dean of the Institute for Future Human Habitat Studies at the Tsinghua Shenzhen International Graduate School. I'm really glad to be able to speak to you today about design science. What I want to show you today is a theoretical framework where we can try and understand what it is that goes on when we design. And for this, I'm going to draw some, some sketches and show you a uh, theoretical framework that I've been working on for a few years now. And I'll explain why this is important as I go along, but it might be a way for us to uh, recalibrate what it is we're discussing when we consider what actually happens during the design process. So if without further ado, I'll switch my camera and then we'll see um, if you can follow me and my pen. So welcome to my world. And in this world, I want to um, basically try and uh, figure out what it is we do when we design. And in order to understand that, I'm going to divide the world into a couple of uh, halves or quadrants. So the first one I'm going to do is to say that there are ideas and there are representations of those. So if I was to draw a line here in the sand, and say, on one hand, I have ideas, and on the other, I have the representation. Representation of those ideas. And I'm going to do this again for a vertical one and say, at the top here, I have bits or the ephemeral, the things we can't touch and see. And then I have atoms, which is the real world, that we can touch and see. And if I have now to uh, think of what happens when I'm thinking of a design, well, an idea that's in the ephemeral world or in the world of bits, that's here. And this is, this is what Gilles Deloise called the potential. And there is a writing that's partially this is based on what he wrote in 1968. And I've set this up in a different kind of uh, quadridium, if you want to call that. And if I'm in, we're looking at the potential, and as an artist, I want to make something, well, all I do is I move down here to what's called the real reality. And I will just take my idea and make it. And that's the, that's the, the artistic imperative. I have an idea, I want to paint a painting, well, I take my paintbrush and I paint it. Now, an architect will not build a building just because you think, okay, well, it should be a hundred story building and you don't just start building it. You need to describe it so someone else can uh, build it. Well, that's what here, uh, again, referring to Deloitte is called the actual. And that's a representation. It's a physical, it's in the, it's in the realm of the atoms. So it's a, it's a physical, uh, representation of something that's real. And that process, that description of is what architects do when they make a, a drawing or a specifications. And then someone else will build it. The production of the, of the building will happen here. And this process is kind of like a vector algebra because that plus that is equivalent to that. So the same design process, the same realization happens but through a different path. And if you wanted to, you can, you can, uh, we'll start to describe these in a, in a few minutes, but um, we see that there's a part that hasn't been named yet. And that's what the virtual is. Now, if someone talks about virtualization, now we have a, a framework to understand what that is. Well, the virtual is a representation of ideas in the realm of the ephemeral or the bits. And if I'm working on a computer, I'm basically putting things in, in the virtual here. And what I don't do though is just do a mind meld with, a, with, a, with, a, with an IBM computer. I first have an interface for that that's physical. So in fact, what I'm, if I'm doing this is in fact a vector algebra that looks like this. So I have a computer screen that shows me what's going on in here. And the computer is putting that onto this physical screen here. And then I'm using that method to do this vector algebra here. And this is very interesting because 
um, when we start to talk about uh, file to factory, what we're talking about is that there will now be a connection straight to the real world here. And I might want to use a different pen just to point this out, that this process here, when we talk about the digital digitization, is actually just a different kind of vector algebra. Um, some would say, well, actually, we're going around here in circles. Like we, we put something in the computer, we then print it out as plans, and those get made into the building, which is, in the end, the same as this. But what's actually happening now with robots and, and STL files is that I don't even need this anymore. I don't need plans. I only need to put make sure that I get them into the computer. That is, I do this. I almost need a different colored pen now. So I take my computer and I put this, I put this into the virtual. And then through a uh, digitization or a mechanization process, I can then create my building. And what I want to do now is stop this and make a clean sheet and then describe the individual actions or the in individual movements because each of those has a name and that will allow us to better understand the process of actualization, realization, virtualization, and potentialization. So here I've redrawn the uh, matrix, or the, as we can call it. And what I was going to do is just try and uh, explain what, the, what, what these different movements are that I just showed you um, and give them some names. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with uh, moving towards the real, because that's maybe the uh, simplest one to understand at first. So as we discussed as an artist, um, if I move towards the real this way, we can call that the art of craft. That's when someone takes something into, with their own hands. And if we have drawings, like the architect has made the drawings, and we now move those to, uh, to the real, then that's what we would call production. And if we have a, a virtual model and we go straight with, a, with mechanically through a robot, then this action is called mechanization. And that's basically when we talk about the realization, that is the moving of, of this uh, design token to the real, the realization has three different ways. One is craft, one is mechanization, and one is production. And we can do this for each of these four quadrants. I've prepared some things. So if I now was to, to look at, um, let's say moving towards the actual, that is what the architect does. Well, this movement here is what we can call description. And that's basically what we do. We describe a building and then someone produces it or builds it. Um, if we, if we uh, have something in the real world and we move it here, well, that's what you would call the documentation. Now, someone could say, well, that's a description, but I'm actually going to say this is actually just documenting what's in the real world, which is different than telling the story of drawing a building. Uh, or, or the storytelling that happens from our minds to this realm of language here. And if we have a, uh, a computer model and we're going to actually put it onto the screen or print it, um, then that's, that's a, a movement that we would call depiction. So the actualization of an idea has, again, three different uh, ways of doing that. There's the documentation, there's the description, and then there's the depiction of, of the idea. So let's continue. Um, let's move around to the virtual. So if I have a, a something in the a, like, a, like a physical drawing, and I want to put it into a computer, well, this movement here is the transcription. And we choose this word because 
the transcription um, has to do with the fact that we need to transcribe what we see here into some kind of structure. That is, the realm of the virtual is, is a one of structure. So we need to structure this, and that means so much like in music where you transpose something from one, one key to another, we need to do that kind of translation or transcription there. Um, if I have something real and I'm putting it into the, a virtual, this action, well, that's what we call modeling. That's where we're trying to represent what we see in the real world and put it into a virtual representation of it. And this is maybe the more interesting one, is if we take something directly from our minds in here, I'm going to call this theorization or trying to transcribe the theory that you have about something here, like an idea of a, of a building into something virtual. Well, it's pretty hard to just do a mind transfer from your, your head to the computer, but through the process of, of indirect uh, ways we can we can actually do that so we can call this the theorization and then I'm going to finish this by just showing you that if I have something in the structure and I'm I can bring it in if I have something in the real world I can bring it into my mind and from that well from the real world we can talk call this interpretation and that's different than the modeling that happens that's just a very visceral thing about how we interpret the world we see. If I am looking at the, the, the language of a drawing or some other kind of description of the world in, in this representation, a, 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 a physical representation, well, I'm going to call that comprehension. And that's um, a nod to reading to when we have that. And then Understanding the model that we have here in the virtual, that's the cognition, that is the understanding of theory. So all of these together form, if I was going to look at them all together, they form a very complex uh, way. And what's important to note is that if I have all of these different things, then I can discuss how we are actually uh, working. So as an architect, we talked about the, originally about a, uh, an artist using craft to create an object. Well, as an architect, I actually then describe through the process of description and then through production, we get to our building. And through the, through the after I've described that and the transcription, to the virtual, then I can depict it to here, or I can use mechanization to get to here. And so what we can, when we talk about the virtualization of, of architecture, what we're actually talking about is a, a way to um, take our theories into the physical world and then using mechanization to produce as accurate as possible and so we, we uh, end up bypassing this realm, maybe with some kind of, uh, some kind of nostalgia for it, um, but it will still be there, but in just a different form. That is the, the physical screens we look at or other, other things like that. Now, that just provides the framework for this. What I wanna do is just go one step further um, before I let you go on to the rest of the, the conference. And I wanna show you another diagram here. And this one is going to uh, be a little different because what I've tried to do is put this in perspective here. And um, I have my, my realms that we've just discussed of ideas of, of uh, the realm, the, the, the bits and the atoms, and I have the representation and the ideas here. And I've put this flat to have time go in the third dimension. That is, I have time coming up here. So we can think of the process of moving from one realm to another as being a kind of spiral through time. And if I take that and put it on its side, that is, if I turn this, and I'm going to physically just turn the piece of paper like that, then if we looked along the axis here of, of uh, this axis, then we would have the ideas up at the top and the, and, or sorry, the, the bits up at the top and the atoms at the bottom. 
and I'm going to draw that for you right now. So magically, the paper has gone blank, um, and I'm going to take my uh, my pen here, and if you remember, we we turned this on its side. So now we have time going in from right to left or left to right, depending on how you think about it. So time is going in this way, and we have the the bits up at the top as before, and the atoms below. And now we can look at how we work as an architect. Well, we work in thinking of, of our, our ideas. Um, we start with an idea and we move along. And at some point we decide we we're finished with that. We want to produce this. And so we transmit this across this barrier to actually build the building. And then this object will continue to exist. And this is basically the story of how a building gets built. So if I wanted to look at these different phases, I could say, well, we have a phase here at the beginning of design. We have a phase of construction or assembly. And then we have a phase of use. And at some point, there will also be the end of use or a reuse perhaps. So we could have different parts where there's some kind of uh, intervention in the building. And at some point there will be an end of life of the building and it will then be documented. And, and basically the, the, the building will cease to exist. And what, what is interesting about this is that we're now describing when we start to talk about circularity and the end of life of the building, we have a, a, a theoretical framework where we can look at this. If we have a BIM model, well, we don't stop the, the virtual version of this. It actually continues to exist through the construction phase, through the use phase, and even perhaps through the disassembly phase and as a historical artifact, even further beyond, which is funny because it means the virtual building has a longer lifespan than the actual building. But what's also important is that this provides them the documentation for all of these, these different phases. So this is the, uh, the disassembly. And when we're talking about digital twins, well, all we're meaning is that there's a dialogue between this virtual building and this real one and having some kind of connection here where the real building is telling the, the virtual building what's actually going on through the sensors and some kind of self-driving building brain could then inform the real building what to do next. And so we have this parallel universe where uh, our real building and our virtual building can be able to discuss with each other. Um, maybe two more interesting points about this. When you look at this, you can see that the most mission critical point is back here when the architect starts. And if the building original description is not done properly, none of this will be able to exist. So if, if we don't have a solid BIM uh, description of the building, then we won't be able to have any digital twins and we won't know what's in this building when we come to end of life. The other aspect is that when you come to end of life, that's just the life of that building, but perhaps the individual objects might continue to exist. And if I were to take this and wrap it up as a cylinder, like to just do this, then of course I can see that the end of life is the beginning of life. So that in fact, there might be some of these objects that are being reused. And when we're talking about um, having a circular economy, what we mean is that this can loop back to this. And that might be at the level of recycling where we have uh, steel being melted into new steel beams, but it also might be at the level of reuse where we are able to take whole building components, be they windows or beams and reuse them in other buildings. And that becomes interesting because the design process is not a question of, well, what have I thought out of the top of my head? Sort of what resources do I have available and how could I combine those in order to make a sensible building? And, and this whole process um, 
is one that, that I, I think is, it has a great potential for us to be able to solve some of the problems that we're facing and to do with CO2, to do with resource optimization, to do with energy optimization. And all I, that I've done and wanted to do today was to be able to show you a kind of theoretical framework that will allow architects to be able to discuss this properly so that when we come to talk about these, these issues, we might have a, a way with this theoretical framework to understand better what it is we do, which is, of course, to try and make the world a better place. So thank you for uh, listening to me today. Um, in some ways, I wish I was there because I would love to have a uh, discussion in this and answer some questions. Unfortunately, that's not possible with the time difference, et cetera. But, um, Hopefully when uh, COVID is over, um, I'll be able to come to Beijing and discuss this with you, my uh, learned colleagues. Thanks and have a great day at the conference.